Thank you very much um, for adding multidisciplinary care to the title of my talk. Um, I've changed it. <laughs> um, multidisciplinary care is becoming, uh, I think, increasingly a fact in the practice of medicine because knowledge is increasing over time and it's increasingly hard for any one person to keep it in their brain. Um, I know I speak from personal experience. Um, so what, what are the aims and the rationales for multidisciplinary care in thalassemia, particularly in the context of iron chelation? Um, the, the care of thalassemia cuts across many different disciplines. Virtually every organ system in the body is affected by thalassemia or the iron overload. And as I've just said, no one person can really be an expert in all those areas. Um, I think you can think of multidisciplinary working within a hospital. So there's a group of people who work in a hospital, they meet regularly, they talk, they try and learn from each other. But also there's multidisciplinary working across hospitals, across the nation maybe, or even internationally. And I'll just touch on that at the end. Uh, and that there needs to be mechanisms for bringing together expertise. Now, the fact we now have Zoom and Teams and all those things mean we have forums uh, to, to allow that, and, and we're all using it much more. And maybe I'll reflect a bit on that. Um, but I think the best structure to achieve multidisciplinary working will depend very much on the local circumstances. And so what I'm going to describe some of the things we do, recognizing that it isn't possible everywhere. So, but that's what we, this is what we do. So, <clears throat> in the management of iron overload in thalassemia, we can involve experts from many areas, hematology or pediatrics, depending on the age of the patient, cardiology, hepatology, endocrinology, experts in growth and development, experts in fertility, reproduction, sexual function, experts in bone metabolism, because osteoporosis, osteopenia is such a problem, renal experts, we see quite a lot of renal problems, experts in imaging, I'm going to touch on that because we assume that you, set, you write a form and the imaging gets done, but it's not as simple as that. Nursing experts who understand the patients and their special problems. Experts in psychology so we can work on uh, achieving an, uh, the best adherence we can. And then they may also involve experts in uh, transplantation or gene therapy if we're referring people away from chelation and transfusion. So there needs to be a good understanding between these so that key decisions can be made in a consistent way. One of the worst things that can happen is you refer someone, say, to an endocrinologist, and they give a completely different narrative from the one you've been working with with the patient. It undermines both them, you, and the patient. So there needs to be some time of communication so we're all on the, basically on the same page. There's going to be some differences obviously between individuals, but we don't want to be a completely different page. Now, this kind of monitoring uh, scheme is in the, in the International Federation guidelines. Um, I'm not, so today, because of the fairly limited time, I'm not going to use this as a, a recipe. I'm just going to point to areas of interest and we can expand on things. So, we obviously need to monitor transfusion. We've heard a bit about that already. We need to uh, monitor the frequency and the dose of the chelation. Dose is really important. People tend to say, I'm on this drug or I'm on that drug, but it's not as simple as that. The dose is absolutely critical uh, to the success or indeed the failure of, of chelation. We need to monitor growth and sexual development. We need to monitor liver function. We need to look at the sequence of ferritin over time, not just an absolute cross-sectional number, but what direction is it going in. We need to look at glucose tolerance and how that's uh, progressing, look at other endocrine systems such as the thyroid and so on. We need a good and internationally recognized way of monitoring liver iron to say 
where it is and what direction it's going, because that's critical to the next point, which is cardiac iron and cardiac function. The two are very closely linked. So what can the haematologist bring to the table or the paediatric specialist? I, th I think in order to bring these things together, they at least need to understand the mechanism and side effects of the chelators and how to manage these and the importance of dose adjustment. Um, they need to understand the pathology of iron overload, how iron overload causes problems and how this is best controlled. And that's not simple because the iron can go up and down. If you clear the, the iron from the blood, it comes back very quickly, so you need to understand the kinetics of the chelators. We need to understand how transfusion practice impacts on chelation. I'm not going to have time to talk about that, but it actually has a big, big effect on how uh, effective your chelation is. We need to understand the complications of iron overload. We need to understand the other treatment options that are available. And so when we refer to another specialist, we need to be able to impart that knowledge because otherwise that specialist isn't going to be able to make a judgment about where their ideas sit. The basic principles of chelation to prevent problems. We've got to balance iron input with iron output. And then, unfortunately, to rescue patients sometimes when iron gets behind, we get behind with the control of iron. What are the principles? How do we get more iron out than, we, than we're putting in? And we need to monitor for underculation and also for overculation because either can be damaging. We need to understand and be able to communicate to the other members of the team the rates of iron loading if we don't chelate. I'm not going to go through this, not time. And then we need to understand the, ph the pharmacology of the different chelators. And as you all know, there are three licensed drugs. There's Desferal, Deferopron, and Deferosarox, or Exjade. And they all have their own tolerability issues. And again, I'm not going to have time to go through those in any details, or I'm happy to answer questions. But we need to know what those problems are. We need to communicate those to other members of the team and to the specialists that we're referring to, so they know what to look out for. We need to understand the relationship between dose and ion excretion, which is shown here for Desfral and for Exjade. And we need to know that if we give too much chelator, <coughs> we get side effects. And if we give too little, we also get problems from the buildup of iron. <coughs> now, the side effects of too much chelator depend on the chelator because the biodistribution bio or where the chelators go is different for each chelator. So for, if a chelator has a propensity has a tendency to go to the central nervous system, it's going to cause more problems there if you give too much. So Desfral is an example there. If it goes to the bone marrow, that could be more of a problem for another chelator, such as deferoprone. If it goes to the kidney, it could be more of a problem for something like Exjade. So we need to understand those biodistributions and the side effects. Now, one of the key uh, specialties we've worked with over the years is cardiology, because when I started, um, heart failure was the major cause of death, and people were coming in almost every month and dying of heart failure. We hardly see that now. We do see it occasionally, uh, if people don't take any treatment at all, but we by and large know how to recognize how high-risk people and how to deal with that. There's some special things that the cardiologist can bring to the table. They can help us in the management of heart failure, not just the chelation side of it. Atrial fibrillation is a very common problem in the older patients, like 60 or 70% have atrial fibrillation. Pulmonary hypertension is an increasing problem in, in older patients. So by looking at the echocardiograms in addition to the cardiac MRI, we can get a big picture of both the right and left sided uh, heart function. The cardiologist needs to, to know and work with us as to know what the tools we have in terms of collating uh, so, so that we're pulling in the same direction by and large. Again, there's going to be some new nuances, some slight differences in approach, but we need to work broadly in the same direction. And you all know this, that by looking at the cardiac T2 star, we can identify people at the highest risk 
of getting heart failure. And this has been hugely helpful in targeting patients for intensification of treatment. No time to talk about that in huge detail, but if the T2 star is less than six milliseconds, then you've got something like a 50% chance of developing heart failure in the next uh, year or so. I think this, is, this looks like a very complicated slide, and it actually is, but I, I wanted to show it just to make a point. This was some work that uh, John Wood's group did, which looked at the relationship between the liver and the heart iron. The liver is not totally separate from the heart, and the heart is not totally separate from the liver. Uh, and if somebody stops taking chelation treatment, the iron will initially build up in the liver, will, but will eventually spill into the heart. So that's an anti-clockwise picture here. Equally, or conversely, if you start chelating somebody hard, who's got iron in the heart, it will come out of the liver first and then out of the heart. So the heart is slow in, slow out on the whole. The liver is fast in, fast out. And you need to take that into account when designing your treatment for an individual. OK, let's move on to the next specialist, endocrinology, diabetes. So in our clinic, we have, uh, we've managed to identify people who are interested and dedicated to looking after thalassemia patients, but have expertise in, say, cardiology or endocrinology. So we, we have a diabetes expert visiting the clinic once a month, and they will review how the, how the diabetes management's been going. Um, they'll look at the, the overall control, uh, and they will discuss whether the new treatments, want, which might be more appropriate, they'll also discuss whether actually insulin or an oral hypoglycemic is most appropriate. So that's great, and it's really helpful to have that. We also need an endocrinologist who can oversee thyroid, the parathyroid, the sex hormones, the, the adrenal side of things, maybe growth hormone. Now, in a sense, the, the hematologist can do that, but it's nice to have someone who really knows it inside out, particularly if we're, we're, we're concerned. So I, I think... The haematologist or the paediatrician can have a pretty broad knowledge and a fairly good knowledge of these things, but sometimes it's helpful to have a, a real expert in their own field, not necessarily in thalassemia. The next thing is the liver. The liver is becoming more and more important, as you probably know. As people get older, um, problems with the liver become more important. And the sorts of things that a liver specialist, we have a uh, a, a liver team who come once once a month and work, work actually with Dr. Dressar. Um, interpretation of abnormal liver function tests. It's quite common for people to get abnormal liver function, liver enzymes. Is that the iron? Is it fibrosis? Is it the drugs they're on? And sorting that out needs some thought and some expertise to do that. And it's important for you as patients to be able to see someone who understands those complexities. The expert on the liver side needs also to understand that the ferritin is not just a reflection of the liver iron. It's a reflection of liver inflammation and also increasingly, unfortunately, liver fat. A lot of the patients we get referred with high ferritin now have got fatty liver. So we need a way of monitoring the, the, the fatty, fatty liver, and there are ways of emerging of doing that with special scans. We need to have an oversight that the liver is being looked at from the ultrasound point of view periodically to make sure that there isn't a development of hepatocellular carcinoma, for example. And it's also useful, we're finding, to do fibro scanning to look at progressive fibrosis to see what direction that's going in. We're still learning how to do that, uh, but certainly there are some patients who seem to have early fibrous formation and others who seem to be relatively immune from it. We need to recognize early development of cirrhosis, perhaps in case we need to intensify treatment. And as I say, we need to identify hepatocellular carcinoma with 
serial ultrasounds and alpha feta protein. This is just one paper showing uh, complications in the heart and the liver with time, and the green is the liver and the red is the heart. This only goes up to 2010, but you can see that liver disease is becoming more and more of a problem in the older patients or a challenge. So the next organ system or next group of experts that we need to interact with are kidney doctors. And quite a lot of patients on x will have increasing creatinine, particularly as the iron overload comes down. So what we're finding is more and more of the patients have very low ferritins. Some of them don't have low ferritins because they have fatty liver. So that's masking. And so that's why it's so important to be able to measure liver iron accurately. Um, so we, we need to understand all those things. And when we refer to a kidney doctor, we need to explain to them, all right, this patient has worse than creatinine. It could be the drugs they're on, but it could be other things. Um, some patients do, do, on XJ develop renal tubular acidosis. Increasingly, again, in the older patients, we see a lot of kidney stones. I don't know if... But I don't, when I talk to people from other countries, I don't, don't see as much, but I have something like 20, 30% of our older patients have, have kidney stones, have current stones. Remarkable. Uh, and I've mentioned renal tubular acidosis. I'll skip because of time. Uh, other experts we need to work with, experts on growth and sexual development, particularly in the children and the adolescents. Obviously, if somebody's not progressing through tannin staging or bone age or sexual development at the right, age, right rate, that needs to be recognized early so that chelation can be intensified before permanent damage ensues. So a good relationship with someone who has an interest and understands the relationship between iron and the anterior pituitary. Another area, we have, we have someone who visits our our clinic and we do them jointly once a month uh, to look at the bones. So older patients quite often have thinning of the bones and get bone fractures and so on. And we need to understand why that is. We need to understand whether that's a lack of sex hormones, whether it's low vitamin D, or loss of calcium in the urine, or protein urea. So we need to understand all these things and come up with a informed view about whether drugs such as bisphosphonates are going to be, be useful or harmful. I, I put this in because um, it, it's th something people are thinking about now. If you go throughout the world, um, go to India or somewhere like that, uh, people come up with a piece of paper and say, T2 star, T2 star. And the problem is that that T2 star hasn't been done properly, and it's been a waste of money. And it's really important that we don't subject people to expensive, uh, valueless tests. And even within our own country, uh, not all the measurements are totally validated. It's actually quite difficult to keep a method up to date, validated. One of the reasons I'm a fan of the ferry scan method is not because it's intrinsically better than the other methods, it's because it's externally validated. You pay for it, and, and you know that the number is what it says on the tin. You know? So to me, that's very important. I, I, I know also uh, with other methods that can be the case, but sometimes it isn't. So this is just a paper showing the different methods which have been used with MRI showing they all have different calibration curves. Another area which is really important is sexual function and fertility. Obviously, both men and women want to be able to have children, or they may want to, and they need to understand if they can't, why they can't. They also need to prepare properly for that. And so that if someone's going to get pregnant and this very keen to get pregnant, or indeed we have to induce ovulation, we want to make sure that the iron chelation is as good as we can get it before they stop taking chelation for nine months. 
because we don't want people to go into heart failure during pregnancy. Maybe the final bit in the jigsaw is having a good psychology department. We have two uh, psychologists who work with us, uh, who, and they need to understand the disease. So they come to our multidisciplinary meetings. They understand a lot about what it means to have thalassemia, how chronic it is. They recognize how depression or stress or life events can impact on people's ability to take daily treatments such as chelation. And they work with patients on cognitive behavioral approaches or mindfulness approaches to try and support people to take and adhere to their treatment. Not, not always a success, but it's hugely helpful in many cases. So, for optimal adherence, we need good recognition, we need rapid access, we need staff that needs to be paid for, we need continuity of care, we need good systems which are organised so that people can be put through to the next stage of investigation without too much uh, disruption, and that we need this multidisciplinary approach. How can we organise the multidisciplinary teams? Well. Having been brought up uh, to the corridor approach to discussing patients, you bump into someone in the corridor and you say, oh, I saw this patient. And actually, that's really useful. And I, I don't think we should lose that. I, I'm finding it's increasingly hard to get hold of anyone on the phone these days. You have to send them some sort of electronic communication, which is fine, but I would want to lose the, the other ones. So phone letters, emails, all those things on an ad hoc personal thing. Face-to-face -face and joint clinics. I've mentioned that many of the clinics we do, we have the expert and ourselves. The, the problem about that, I guess, is it, it's very resource heavy. It takes time. We have to pay for, the, for two doctors, which is terribly expensive. Um, and then we have the Zoom and Teams meetings. We, we have them within the hospital every week. We have network local networks, and we have national uh, networks. And Baba, who's the next speaker, is the chair of one of those networks, and I'm sure could contribute to that. I think it's really useful for experts sharing knowledge, trying to make difficult decisions about whether to transplant someone or whether to give them the latest treatment that's available or not. So th these, are all, these all add to the multidisciplinary nature. So this came from the TIF guidelines a few years ago, and you can see sitting in the center is the thalassemia physician with all the people around them. And I just wonder whether that's the best model and whether we should all be around the table talking to each other without... Uh, it does need someone to co coordinate, but it doesn't have to be a hematologist who's in charge. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>